for having me back. Um, as Rebecca said, we've been talking about this for a while, probably before Christmas, actually. Um, but what with everything going on, um, we finally got around to sorting this one out. So I'm just going to share my screen and hopefully this is going to work. Um, point. Can you guys, Rebecca, you can see my screen, my PowerPoint now? Yeah, yeah, we can. Super, cool. Um, yeah, as I say, it's what I've been sitting on for a while. In fact, to be honest, I've probably been sitting and thinking about this subject for maybe six to eight years, to be honest. <laughs> Not been planning a presentation for that long. But um, the reason being is that, you know, every time I change my photographic genre, I think, oh, gosh, you know, I've either got to learn something new or, oh, gosh, this is very similar to the last one. And I had no idea. Um, so the principles of successful photography, whatever the genre. Um, I'm going to go through, hopefully, not every single genre, because I haven't shot every single genre in my life, but um, I'm going to cover lots, loads and loads of photographic examples and hopefully run you through some real basics, uh, or what I consider to be real basics that cover every single genre, whether you're photographing flowers, babies, birds, motorbikes, landscape, whatever, hopefully you'll come away at the end of this um, presentation to be inspired to maybe try a different genre or be a little bit more aware or um, appreciative of other people's genres that they're shooting, uh, but actually they're not that different to your own. I'm just going to put this one on here. Um, can you see the whole screen there? You're not seeing my slides, are you? Uh, yes, we can see the whole screen. There it is. That's right. I'm working on two, two uh, um, what do you call this? <laughs> so just a couple of slides to get you started. I just want to show you that this is where I started. Um, when I started photographing 16 years ago, um, I started as a portrait photographer. I did weddings, I did babies, I did families. I still do them now, but this is where I started. And most of you know me for this. This is where I am now. Um, and I really want to show you how the two link up today and how you, you know, you can just move, um, sort of move between the two without any problem. So those of you who don't know me, um, my background, as I said, I started photographing about 16 years ago. I joined the Guild probably about 11 years ago now and went through all the levels of the qualification, crafts and master crafts, and I finally became a panel member about two years ago now, I think it was. And as I said, started with portrait photography and now I work mostly in creative landscape, multiple exposures, ICM, that kind of thing. Um, but in my background, I've, I have photographed all of these genres, portrait photography, inside and out, families, babies, weddings, horse events and horse portraits, product photography, food, events, schools, graduations, landscape, interior, travel, macro, creative, ICM, and multiple exposure. And there are probably a million others that I've left off the list that I try my hand at at any time. To be honest, unless I'm really actually scared of photographing something, I will always give it a go because I know I have enough skills and I know it's just a case of moving the skills between the genres now. And this is just a little example, tiny example. I mean, gosh, I picked, I picked from 16 years for photos, I picked these few for you, but it just gives you a little feel for my style of photography. It tends to be quite light, tends to be quite bright. Um, it's, yeah, it, it's what I like to do, but I, you know, I do change the style according to the subject matter that I'm photographing. Quick caveats, okay, not every single, um, sorry, nearly every single image in this presentation is my own. I did ask um, uh, Anne Aveyard for some bird photos just because that was out of my um, comfort zone <laughs> and you'll see why when we get to that point. So she's kindly lent me uh, a couple of photos just for this presentation to show you something that I wanted to discuss. They are not all award winning images. In fact, some of them for the purpose of just showing you what I want to show you are actually straight out of camera images. So if you do spot the odd dust spot, if you do think something's a little overexposed, please, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to make them out to be award winning images. There are some award winning images in there, but I'm um, just so you're aware and they're not all perfect, but I'm just gonna use them to discuss the various aspects within this presentation. So I'm just going to start with a love me or hate me for it statement, okay? There are a couple of myths that we should get addressed before I even get started, and I hope by the end you will understand why 
I've put these forward to you to start with, and you will agree with me by the end if you don't at the moment. Myth one, your genre is harder than another. Every genre is different. No genre is harder than another, but you need very different skills for each one, okay? So for example, baby and bird photography requires endless patience. That's why I don't do it very often because I don't have endless patience. I am not a bird photographer, full stop. I cannot even fathom sitting outside for hours waiting for a bird hopefully to appear. Um, equine photography requires several helpers. Believe me, trying to make a horse stand in the right place, putting its ears forward, making itself look pretty with one person is nigh on impossible. Landscape photography requires research and early mornings and lots of walking. Wedding photography needs a mass of skills, you know, not just portrait photography, but doing event photography, location photography, landscape photography, it all comes into one thing. Portrait and wedding photography, you need people skills as well as camera skills. Macro photography requires absolute precision, stillness, and a real eye for detail. Event photography requires an understanding of what's gonna happen and being in the right place at the right time. And creative photography requires an ability to look beyond the obvious and be brave in your belief that what you're photographing is what you want to put out there, regardless of whether anybody else agrees with it. But all of these genres share some basic photographic skills, okay, which is what I'm gonna try and bring to you during this presentation. The other myth, <laughs> maybe slightly more controversial, judges can only judge the genre they photograph. Now, believe it or not, most judges have actually learned and practiced various special photo, uh, various photographic genres before they specialize. For example, I've had extensive portrait lighting uh, training, but I now shoot landscapes and creative. And many of the other panel members on the Guild have done exactly the same. Of course, if there's a choice where um, an association, not just the Guild, but an uh, association or a photo club can choose whether they have somebody to judge that knows exactly what they're doing or whether it's general, then, then they probably will choose to have somebody that's got that specialism. But we all know camera clubs, online competitions, you quite often have one job judge and they judge many different genres, okay? And when you're called to do that, it is possible to do that regardless of the genre that you specialize in. So again, the principles that I'm gonna discuss in the presentation, you will see override the genre of photography that's going to be judged. So these are the things I want to cover today, uh, and I'm desperately hoping I keep within the time for you. Um, fundamental basics, exposure, depth of field, shutter speed, balance, light, point of focus, composition, background, guiding rules, storytelling and emotion, and post-production. <laughs> But all of these are completely dependent on what your intention for the photograph is, okay? This is my sort of guiding thing right at the beginning of any time that I teach, any time I think about a photograph, I'm going to do all of those things that I just mentioned to you, but also your vision is really important and it goes for any genre whatsoever. Take the time to ask yourself what you want to bring to the image, whether this is at the point of making the photo or whether this is at the point that you're doing post-processing. If you keep asking yourself this question, you will actually probably knock most of that list, previous list, out of the, out of the park regarding decisions, because you do have to make decisions regarding each of those things when you're photographing. So I've got a few photos that's just come up, and I just want you to have a look at them. They're just like an introduction here before I get properly started and just have a think about what they have in common. And you might be really surprised when you start seeing next, these two next to each other, you might suddenly start already seeing that there are similarities. So these two, two beauties, a beautiful horse and a beautiful girl. I'm pretty sure you can tell which is which, <laughs> but you know, um, what are we talking about? We're talking about light, we're talking about background, we're talking about posing, we're talking about direction of light. Um, we're talking about exposure, depth of field, both of these require you to have a think about all of those things. This one, doesn't matter whether you're cuddling a horse, cuddling a husband, cuddling a baby. <laughs> Again, exposure, depth of field, balance, 
um, post-production, all these things you can see, I've chosen to keep them all black and white here. So you can see they're all so very similar when you start looking at them um, in relation to each other. These two are a little bit more different, but they're both outside. But again, we're looking at composition. We're looking at putting things in the right places. We're looking at managing light. We're looking at balance. We're looking at depth of field. All these kind of things you continue to use regardless of the genre. And again, something a little bit brighter. A cake, some water, you know, choosing the depth of field for the, both of these was really important. Choosing the balance, choosing the composition, again, was really, really important. So your first one is exposure. So no matter what your genre, your image should be correctly exposed, okay? You should have details in the shadow and detail in the highlights and a range of tones throughout your image. Um, if the image is deliberately high or low key, you need to make sure that's clear with your post-processing or with the way you actually make the photo. And if you don't already shoot in RAW, shooting in RAW can be a really good way to um, manage to pull back the highlights or push the shadows a little bit when you come to post-processing. Now, where are we going to find highlights most often where we're not comfortable with them when we, when we look at images? Um, clouds, quite often there's uh, blown up areas in clouds, bright dresses, white flowers, street lights during night photography, uh, sunsets and sunrises, edges of things where the sun catches them, which maybe you didn't notice, points of the cheek, nose, um, the edges of like a vase or something when you're photographing flowers, shiny or silver elements, water reflection, and anywhere where you can see a lot of contrast, okay? And these are just some examples where the highlights have been blown. That top right one, as I said, they're not all award wedding images. This was actually one of my first ever weddings that I shot like years and years and years ago. And I look at it now quite horrified because so many of the highlights are blown, but I'm using it as an example for you all to see. Uh, bottom left, rooms beautifully exposed, but all the uh, lights or the highlights are completely blown in all the lights. The one on the right, the Amsterdam Canal, again, is beautiful and I love it, but uh, the little starbursts, they're all completely blown highlights. There is no detail in the middle of the highlights. And the one in the middle at the bottom is where I've tried to recover uh, an over-highlighted sky and try and manage the sunlight coming through. Uh, blacks, most often too dark. Quite often we see this, uh, certainly in the image of the month, where backgrounds have been changed, okay? You've tried to put a background on that wasn't there before, or you've tried to get rid of something in the background and use a black mark, uh, black paintbrush. And basically that is just matte black. There is no detail, it is just black. And you can see that in this horse photo. That's why I just did it as an example here. I've gone around making this horse photo look as though it's on a black background, but actually when you uh, check it in Lightroom, you can see there's absolutely no detail in those blacks at all. <coughs> Tree trunks, quite often I struggle with those. They sometimes come out a little bit black, black dresses, of course, uh, backgrounds of things and silhouettes. Um, you do need to be very careful when you're trying to balance highlights in the background with foreground dark shadows. And again, you've got some examples there where the blacks have just been um, you know, the, the places where I find it quite tricky to keep black sometimes. Okay, so this is your first example here, a uh, lovely flying horse. And I have actually pushed this past where it was before just for the purposes of teaching, but you'll see it looks quite well exposed overall. But if you start to notice, you see at the top of the horse's bottom, it's actually completely white. And you'll see in a minute, there's absolutely no detail. Same with things like the hooves and the saddle here. Okay, in my desperation to get all the blacks and whites, what has happened is that I've actually gone a little bit too far with the editing for the purposes of this, okay? If you're in Lightroom, you can use the histogram up on the top right-hand side here um, when you're in Lightroom. And if you click on these two little arrows that are on either side of the histogram, you can turn on the, we'll call them blinkies or the, the highlights that will show you when the highlights or the blacks are blown or are too dark. And so here you can see the red areas where the highlights, there's no more detail in the whites. And on this one, the blues are where there's no more details in the black. If you're on Photoshop, you can use the eyedropper tool on any area of the, uh, the horse or, or your photo, in fact. And if you then look at the information on the right-hand side, you will then look and see 
And if your numbers for shadows are should be over five and the details, if you're going to have highlights in the detail, you want to have the, the number below 251. Full part figure. You don't ever want to push it right to the edge. And here are just a few examples, again, using photographs from different genres to show you some examples of the balancing of exposure here. So on the left hand side, there's a lot of chance here for blown highlights, but manage to hold them down, but also keep detail without it looking as though it's gone gray or anything. On the right hand side, these areas here, you get lovely sunlight coming through um, the, the trees here and you have to be very careful. You either work on it post-processing or you expose for the highlights when you're making the photos. Same again, babies and ICM next to each other, very different genres, but you can see again, both have got detail throughout the, uh, all the blacks and the whites throughout. As I alluded to before, it doesn't matter whether it's your husband, believe me, if you have a horse, and I know a few of you maybe do have a horse, your horse is probably just as important as your husband. And people love to have photos of their horses as much as they do with their husbands. And it's just an example here to show you there's a couple in both these images. We have them exposed beautifully. The horse doesn't have any burnt highlights. There's no burnt highlights in the dress. And there's detail through the blacks in both images as well. And again, Small children, cupcakes, again, same principles occur. Make sure the exposure throughout the image is balanced. Again, here, black and white. Black and white on the left was actually a post-process black and white. The one on the right isn't actually black and white, but it's all got blacks and whites. Again, it's making sure that you've got detail through both. Now, it's always best to try and get it right in the camera. There is no substitute for getting it right in the camera, but we all know that when you're faced with a contrasty subject, it's very, very difficult to balance the whole thing sometimes. And this picture on the right-hand side was shot beautifully out of, almost straight out of camera and managed to control the light that morning. Um, it was, uh, yeah, it was just beautiful, the light that came up. The one on the left, the sun came up and the sun actually comes up just sort of out to the left of where both these shots were taken. And so it can, once it comes up, the bottom of the sky is extremely bright. And you can see on the left-hand side one, I've tried to rescue this image. And certainly on my screen, you can see this massive halo going across the top of it. Yes, it will print with color in your uh, print eventually. If it was set into image of the month, it would lose marks because you can see there's a definite halo. You can see there's a definite use of vignette on there just to try and manage that overexposure. So as I said, try and expose for what you want to when you're taking the photo. Depth of field should be sub suitable for the subject. Now, remember one subject may have various different options depending on what you want to portray in your image. And this goes back to me right, saying, right at the start of your, um, right at the start of the presentation, have a think about what you actually want your image to say, okay, when you're making it. If you want to bring attention to one point within your image or make one area or element more important than the other, you're probably going to be using a shallower depth of field. So a low F number, F2.8, F5.6, something like that. If you want to show detail from front to back in an image, you're going to be looking for a deeper depth of field, something from F16, F22, maybe F32 if your lens allows it. Specific genres, be aware the elements within, regardless of genre, you do need something that's in focus within the image. Now I do a lot of ICM and believe it or not, there's always one point within that image that starts in focus, even if the whole thing doesn't look as though it's not in, in focus at the end, you always start with at least one point in focus. So for your different genres, in a group shot, everyone probably needs to be in focus, okay? I say probably because maybe you might choose that actually you only want the bride and groom to be in focus. But in general, if you shoot at f2.8, you're probably only gonna have a couple of people in a group that are sharp, and that's probably not what you want to achieve. In a landscape, when you've got interest throughout the image, such as interesting foreground and interesting background, you need a depth of field to make sure you capture that. And quite often that's things from, you know, something in the field that's in front of you, right to whatever happens to be on the mountains in the background. Um, 
eyes need to be in focus and most often both. Again, I say most often because if it's your decision that you've chosen not to have both eyes in focus, that's fine, but it needs to be the right choice or it needs to be clear that that's the choice you've made. Dogs and cats, beware of a shallow depth of focus when the eyes are beautifully sharp, but the nose is not, because actually there's quite a long distance, it depends on how long your dog's nose is, but there is actually quite a distance regarding depth of field when it's from the end of the nose to the eyes. And equally, if you get the focus point wrong, you might have focused on the nose and have eyes that aren't sharp. And that's a bit of a no-no within most images. Butterflies and insects and birds, you again need to decide how much you're going to get in focus. Do you just want the eyes? Do you want the eyes and the antennae? Do you want the feet? Do you want the wings? You know, it's a decision that you can make. Again, think about it before you make it, basically. Couples, it can be intentional to have a shallow depth of field so that you accentuate one individual rather than another. But if that's not the plan, make sure you have enough depth of field that you can capture them both sharp. For food in interiors, objects, again, are you looking to accentuate the element or do you want the whole front to back sharp? For some rider portraits, make sure if you want them both sharp that your depth of field is great enough to get them both sharp. And event photography, you need to know what actually is important within what you're photographing and then figure out whether it is including background or whether it's not um, and then make a decision regarding that. So for starters, just a bit of landscape here. Uh, well, it's sort of architectural urban landscape. Um, generally, I do shoot with a greater depth of field. Um, my lens, my go-to lens is a 20, well, I work with a 24 to 70 and a 70 to 200, and they both go up to f22. I know other people have uh, other prime lenses and such, which can go up to f32, and some of the um, other kit lenses can go higher. Basically, I make sure that I focus on something normally near the front of the image, and then I make sure that the whole of the rest of the image is in focus. Okay, so in both of these, everything is in focus front to back. And what I don't want is anybody looking at this image and going in a little bit closer and going, oh, I wish I could read the sign in the background, or, oh, do you think she meant not to have that last little bit in focus? I don't want ever to anybody question me. So if that's my intention, I make sure that's what I do. Same with woodlands. I shoot an awful lot of woodlands and it's just a case of deciding how much of that woodland I want in front focus. Left hand side, when I'm shooting tree lined avenues, I generally want to try and get the front trees in focus and I want to get whatever's in the background, normally sun rays coming through, that kind of thing. And again, this one on the left, completely in focus from front to back. The one on the right, I chose it to be more about this line of black trees and the sun coming through them. So I chose a shallower depth of focus. It's not like a 2.8, but it's certainly not an F16 because I wanted these trees at the front to be the most important elements. Um, flowers, still life, objects, anything you've chosen to shoot, uh, maybe that's not living, we'll take it for example here. Well, actually these are living, they're flowers. <laughs> Um, again, decide what you want your image to be about. Is it about the location? Is it about a setting? Is it about a feeling? Are you wanting to draw attention to these objects? So these two are exactly the same sort of subject matter. The one on the left is all about the tulips in the field and the sky above. The one on the right is all about that colorful tulip and its detail and its dainty sort of flowers. So you can see a very different depth of field used for both of these. Baby photography, newborns. Sometimes you want everything sharp. Sometimes you just want to focus on the really important little bits that you want to draw attention to. Um, portrait photography, again, when you're shooting families, you need to make sure that everybody's got their eyes in focus. The one on the right hand side, a little bit more creative. Again, both eyes are definitely in focus, but everything front and back is not out in focus anymore. Wedding photography here, we've got a difference between shooting wide, shooting back to front for um, with a bit greater depth of field for the group shot versus a little bit of a detail shot on the right and just focusing in on the point that I wanted to draw attention to. I do graduation photography as well. Again, they ask that the back of the building is in focus with the name. I need that as well as the students in front. The one on the right, 
we go up, we make use of the background and it's colorful, but then I use a shallower depth of field so it's no longer quite as sharp. And this one, just as the last one, this is an example of so the cheese market here in the Netherlands. And this is an example where we've used lots of different levels of depth of field in one location to tell the story. Okay, so you've got everything from F22 in the, top, uh, the bottom and the left corners to um, a shallower depth of field with the individuals. So shutter speed. This is open to interpretation because it really rather, again, depends on what you want to bring to the image. But if you want it to be sharp or blurred, make sure what you want to achieve is clear, okay? If you're aiming for a perfectly sharp image, make sure the fastest moving point is what you've set your shutter speed for, and I'll look at that in a minute. Know the lower limits of your ability to handhold a camera, okay? I can't go much below 100 for a second. Some people can go much lower. Just be aware of that. If you are using slower shutter speeds, you may need a tripod to ensure that only the bits that you want to be blurred are actually blurred. And if you're working with intentional camera movement, make sure it's obvious. It's uh, There's nothing worse than seeing intentional camera movement that I can't quite tell whether it was actually intentional or, or not. So again, if you mean it to be sharp, you mean it to be blurred, make sure you make it clear, dead clear on both of these. You know, there's no question that that was just a camera shake on the right hand side. And if you look at the one on the left, it's absolutely pin sharp. Same with these tulips, the one on the left, beautiful still life, beautiful lip with the flash, and it is pin sharp from front to back, all the detail in there. The one on the right was uh, an ICM, and you can quite clearly see it was meant to be moving, it was meant to be blurred. These ones sit a little bit closer together. Uh, the one on the right was aiming to capture the movement. It was a leaf on the floor, and I was aiming to capture the water still. The one on the left, I actually moved my camera, so it's definitely blurred. But that one's sort of open to interpretation. You might say the, the left one's sitting a little bit close to looking blurred rather than ICM. So, um, action shots. Again, make sure you check your settings. If you've got enough time, make sure you figure out what is the fastest setting you need for what you want to shoot. And the long, the more often you do something, the more often it will just be a go-to figure. You know, we all know such and such a figure for moving people, moving cars, that kind of thing. And it's the same with horse photography, wedding photography. You don't want these guys on the left-hand side to be slightly blurred in any way. So it's better to put up the shutter speed a little bit higher. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> um, this one here, this is a slow shutter speed, not an intentional camera movement. And so it was used on a tripod. And so the rocks in the foreground and the rocks in the background are pin sharp and the only movement is whatever happened to be moving in the image during the time I was shooting it. The one on the right is an intentional camera movement. So the sky in the background is blurred as are the birds as they moved across. And this is what I meant about if you're aiming for a perfectly sharp image, make sure that you have taken into account the bit of the body that's moving the fastest, okay? Um, generally with animals, it's the legs or the wings. It's not the body set itself. The body tends to be uh, moving along and the legs or the, the wings are moving a lot faster. So do be careful with something like that. Again, if you want to add a little bit of creativity and you want to include movement, this is where you can do it by choosing a shutter speed. But again, these are the kind of things you need to make a conscious decision on. Do you want it to be sharp or do you want it to be slightly blurred or very blurred? And this is where I bring Anne's photos in because this is as good as my bird photography gets. And actually, it does kind of show what I want to show. You know, the bottom of the bird was quite sharp and the wings are blurred. But you will see from Anne Aviard's beautiful bird photos that her images are like more than just a little bit better than mine. Um, and that's why I asked whether she'd kindly lend me a couple for this uh, um, presentation. Exactly the same thing. The bird is doing exactly the same thing. It's flying through the air, okay? And you can tell that she meant for both of these to happen. The one on the left is absolutely pin sharp. That wing is moving. It's not stopped. It is moving. And she's got it absolutely pin sharp. The one on the right, that Kingfishers, eye, beak, tummy are absolutely pin sharp. Even the, the um, feathers on its back are pin sharp. However, 
she has just played with the shutter speed long enough uh, and slowed it down just a slight amount that allows to put a little bit of movement into the wings, okay? And then that allows you the feeling of movement. So again, it depends on what you want to bring to the image. And the same with these, she sent me so many lovely images. I wanted to share a couple with you. Um, this lovely one of this, uh, I think it's an eagle. Again, I'm not a bird person. Uh, soaring, absolutely pin sharp. It's moving, um, but it's it's really good. And then this beautiful robin, you can hear him singing and you can hear those wings beating because of what she's managed to capture in this image. And again, you can tell this was intentional. The eyes are pin sharp, the breast is pin sharp, everything else is absolutely pin sharp. It's just the wings that are moving very slightly. Sorry, some of these um, slides have got a little bit too much wording on, but I'm talking over them anyway, so you don't need to read them if you don't want to. Quite often, um, you will take, people take slow shutter speed photos of water, okay? On a beach or by a waterfall, by a river. And if you don't happen to have a tripod with you, you might give it a go and see if you can get away with it handhold, okay? Another time you might be struggling with possible blur is inside churches or darker locations, museums or um, you know, place, art galleries, places that you go and you want to take some photos. So first of all, you generally increase your ISO to get a bit more light in. Then you uh, open up your f-stop a little bit to get this light in. And then if you're still struggling for light, you should slow the shutter speed, which is fine until you go too slow for your hand or something moves within the image, okay? Um, and then you have a bit of movement that you didn't want within the image. Shooting landscapes, quite often when I'm in the woods, I put my camera on a tripod. I will um, then put it up to the depth of field that I want, and then I will slow my shutter speed, which is great until the leaves move on the trees, the flower moves, something like that, which you haven't noticed and then you get movement in your image because your shutter speed is not fast enough. Now, I'm not sure how good you guys can see this on the screen. This is one I took at one fifth of a second handheld when I was on holiday, and I got the water movement that I wanted, but when you go in, the mossy rocks are no longer sharp, okay? And this, again, is something you need to make sure is absolutely bang on for things like image of the month, competition images because otherwise it was never intentional that you meant to make the rocks slightly blurry, okay? Unless the whole thing is blurry in an intentional camera movement. And so that shows that the intention of the image was not absolutely spot on with the technical trying to get it right. This one here, again, shot on a tripod, shot at night so I could do a bit of light painting and balance up the image. If you actually look carefully, you will see in the foreground here and also in the background where the trees were, it then gave them long enough to move. Okay, there's some reeds down here and it doesn't detract too much of this image from this image, but it's not absolutely ideal. I would have liked it all absolutely pin sharp. <coughs> balance, okay. Now this is thinking about balancing objects within your image, okay. It might be you're balancing similar objects, people with people, or it might be that you're balancing people with um, lampposts, something completely unrelated. So here we're just starting with some um, landscape kind of type images. Here on the left-hand side, this is actually one of my really early landscape images and I love it so much still. Um, that image would not be what it is without those two people on the bike, okay? They add in a point of focus, but they also can create balance with the tree. Equally, without the tree there, it wouldn't have been a similar image. And the one here on the right-hand side, this landscape in Rotterdam, again, it's balanced with both elements, big elements on the left and right, and then some smaller elements in the background in the middle. Um, again, the one on the left could have been taken without that tree, would have been a nice photo still, but I believe that adding the tree in there really gives balance. It kind of holds the, gives, gives a comparison of size as well for the windmill, um, but I think it really adds a, a feeling of balance in the image. One on the right, again, not one of my best photos at all, and I don't do it very often. I don't shoot in tutorials very often, but this is just to show you how you can balance a room. Maybe if you're working with a room and it's something new that you're doing or you're giving it a go, is just think about balancing elements within the room um, to do that. Again, a really subtle one. What would this image have looked like without this little tree in here? 
I'll tell you what, it would have been a mass of grey and brown and white and no interest in nearly a third of the image here, okay? But with that little tree, it just gives the eye somewhere to move round in the middle, okay? And so now you have a balanced image. This one looks lovely, little kid chasing a couple of um, uh, sheep. Gosh, proper COVID brain fog there for a second. Um, uh, so, you know, you've got a lovely line running from one to the other, and you've got a lovely balance between these two sheep and this little kid running across. And those are kind of like, you know, less obvious balance. Then you have standard group balancing. Think about what people are wearing. Think about people's heights. Think about maybe gen genders, not so important these days, but think about balancing your group. Don't be scared to ask a couple to move from one side or to the left or move, to move individuals around that helps balance up your image better. This one on the right, I actually chose to put the trees in the middle and I chose the three trees rather than splitting them up or anything. And I chose to put them in the middle rather than on the left or the right because there was nothing. And then it would have been, I would have felt it would have been very unbalanced, the image. But here they sit, they're solid in the middle and they kind of balance the image into three chunks uh, left to right. A bit more people, again, these two here, um, using plants. So you've got people and plants to use as the balance elements within the image. So that just holds them in place and you don't fall out of the image when you're looking at it. And here, this lovely line here coming in balances and adds to the story of what's going on here. Again, very different genres food and flowers. Again, these elements that are in the image are there to balance. They're not there to take away from what, what the photo is about. They're, they're just there to allow the eye to sit comfortably where it should without falling out of the image. This has just been a big empty space. Your eye probably would have gone out the back. Same here. Might have been better without the petals, who knows? But I chose to put the petals here because then it kind of holds your image back into the flower. Point of focus. What do you want the most important element to be? Okay, is it in the background? Is it in the foreground? You have the ability to choose where your focus point is on your camera. Is it a specific element that you want to bring attention to in the image? Um, when you're using shallow depth of field, you really, really need, need to nail it. Anybody that's done um, anything with a macro lens will know how easy it is to miss that point of focus if you don't nail it completely. Um, decide if you're going to choose or your camera's going to choose, because if you let your camera choose, it may be fine or it may not be. Um, and equally, make sure your lenses are calibrated up to scratch, because otherwise, sometimes you can think that you're focusing at a point and your camera may be focusing just a fraction or a hair's point away from where you're thinking, which means that all of your image of us will be slightly off point with their focus points. Again, just a collection of images showing you choosing the focus point. Okay, here I chose for the little baby fingers. Everything else is a little bit out of focus. Here, I chose for this sticks that are sticking out of the ground as the focus point. Here, the focus point is in the middle here, okay, on the salmon. Here on this one, I chose, it's quite tricky on this one to make a decision on the focus point, but I chose this white line to be the focus point because it was the one point of difference or the point of contrast within the image because it was the only light post hold within there. And here quite a shallow depth of field, I wanted to tell the story, chose to focus just on the glass, bride's still in the background there, so you've still got the elements there. This one here shot through some uh, trees, uh, shot, shot through a, a house plant and made sure they were the focus point. This was just a plant in my front uh, guard, front window, um, trying to get that right on the edge. That was a challenge. I don't have a macro lens, so I was actually working on a zoom lens and trying to get it. That was quite a challenge. Here again, you'll see the eyes and the beak are perfectly in focus. Everything else actually isn't completely in focus. So some of the feet aren't, the tail isn't, but the most important thing and the focus point has been chosen here. Again, I was shooting through my window the other day making a conscious effort and just playing with playing with the focus point. What happens when I focus on the trees outside of the window? What happens when I focus on the raindrops on the inside, not the inside of the window, but on the window? And then what happens if I focus somewhere between? And I actually quite like the result in the middle there. Birds, this is getting it wrong, okay? Beautifully sharp. This one, 
actually forgot the focus point is on the moss here. The eye is not pin sharp here on this one. And same here, I managed to get the focus point on the grass here, not on the bird. And my lovely dog, I managed to get the focus point beautifully on his nose and got the eyes out of focus. Same, I'm showing you some uh, fall at the hurdle photos here. I managed to get this one in focus. This is the one that I meant to get in focus. And same again here, I needed to have uh, chosen a, either a different depth of field or a different focus point within this one to get that one right. Composition, and this includes balance, depth of field, point of focus, also leading lines, rule of third, negative space, direction people look at. I'm just aware of the time, so I'm trying to move on through these. Um, again, leading lines, balance. Uh, this one has beautiful leading lines. You follow the people and you continue into the distance a little bit here. This one's got lovely balance, great depth of field, um, choice, um, yeah that kind of thing. And this one here, again, these guys are lo looking across into a little bit of space here. The same with this one, giving her a little bit of space. That's where her body language, not necessarily her eyes, but her body language is pointing in that direction. It just needs a little bit more space um, for that in that case. Same with these, again, think about um, the balance of things, think about um, the composition, Think about leading lines, think about rule of thirds. Again, things to think about. I won't say, I won't, I won't say loosely, but you don't have to obey all these things, but generally it does help your image to be a stronger image if you can get these slightly better. Regarding placement of the images of your subject in the image, if you're doing things that are moving or people that are looking in a certain way, give them some space, okay? I've just cropped these to show you, but this was the original image. The horse had room to gallop into, okay? If I wanted to think, oh, I want to crop the horse beautifully, the horse now looks as though it's about to run into the front of the uh, front of the photo. Same with this one. The original photo, I gave the horse loads of space to jump through the water in. This one, you don't know where that horse is going next. You don't know if there's a jump there. You don't know if it's about what it's seen. Whereas this one, you get a better feeling of the story. Same with these birds, have a bit of space to fly into, okay? You never want birds or animals to be walking onto the edge of a, an image. Um, storytelling and emotion, okay? This is, this is a really interesting one. And believe it or not, even when I do my landscape work, I work at putting storytelling and emotion into it, okay? Just remember, you are the only one who was there when you created the image, okay? When you get an image back from Image of the Month and it's not been graded as you think and you say, but this was how it was. No one can know except for you how it was. So what you have to do is bring that to the image, okay? If you want to bring a feeling of sadness, if you want to bring a feeling of sunniness, if you want to bring a feeling of the birds singing, you have to do that. You can't expect someone else to feel it unless you do it yourself. Um, think about connection between images or maybe it might be connection between the camera and the individuals. Some of them are just, I won't say so easy, but you know, it's spotting the moment the emotion happens, okay? It's reacting and capturing that and being ready with your composition, with your balance, with your image that you want to take. <coughs> three different photos from the same photo shoot all capturing different emotions okay we've got these two on the left just a stellar picture very both very happy looking at the camera and then you have this real sort of intimate moment next door with her and then even more intimate with the two ponies below people you know brides babies you can tell stories they don't have to just be uh, individual people you can bring elements and ways to make you uh, bring a story or emotion into these pictures. With birds, two very different feelings. It was with, these are two different photos. It's not a crop of one and another, but they give a very, very different feeling of what I was wanting to shoot. The one on the left gives a feeling of the location, the height, the landscape. The one on the right just gives a feeling of birds. So again, it depends what you want your story, your image to tell. These were just given to me. <laughs> uh, beautiful painter out in the landscape here. His dog sat outside a bakery. Both just literally snapped on the hoof. I was walking through the town one of these 
And this one, I was out on my bike in the tulip fields and I spotted it. Sometimes you've just got to be ready and go for it. And this is what I was talking about. How do you bring emotion to landscapes? How do you bring emotion to trees? You know, this one I stood and I felt a mad, immense feeling of sort of sadness for this one tree that was left standing and surrounded by its fallen, you know, brothers and sisters just piled around the bottom of it. And I was trying to bring that to an image. I don't know whether I success or succeeded or not, but that's what I was trying to bring. And this one on the left, I wanted to bring this feeling of openness and coldness and aloneness to this image. Again, looking at the camera or looking off camera, it's your choice. Just think about the story that you're telling. Okay, it's very subtle here, almost exactly the same, but in this one, the horse and the dog and the girl are looking straight at the camera. On this one, the dog and the horse are looking in a different direction to the girl. Again, it depends what you want it to be. And this one, again, is a self-portrait that I took the other week. I really wanted to bring this feeling of sadness of these trees having fallen down. Um, and so, again, I thought about what I wanted to bring to the image. I thought about my posture. I thought about the setting up of the camera, that kind of thing. So lots of things thinking about before I actually took the image. Background, okay. Pay attention when you're shooting. Things can come out of people's heads. Light patches where you didn't notice them. Distracting elements that challenge for your attention. Is your background integral to the story of the image? With environmental portraits, it's essential that you can see what's going on in the background. Sometimes in weddings, the background creates the story. It's the father of the bride who's nearly fallen off his chair as his daughter's just said something really special to him. You know, these things really can matter at times. Flowers or objects, you might want some of the background in there to give it a feeling of connection to what you're taking a photo of. Your decision of what to take out or what to leave in can have a massive effect. When you come to doing post-processing, that's what PP stands for, another pair of eyes is also useful. And don't be scared to turn your up images upside down. I suggest this to a lot of people. You're amazed. When you turn your images upside down, you're no longer connected to them in the same way. And you'll then pay attention to where your eye actually goes within the image. These three images, exactly the same guy, exactly the same seat. Um, but what I wanted to do is create some very different portraits. One was a very sort of straight corporate portrait. Uh, the one on the right, I wanted to put him in his um, environment. He's a, um, a trainer for a big football team. And so I put him in the stadium for a purpose. I didn't then not want to show him in his location. And then the bottom left one, I just love the lines and the colour behind. Same on the run and right. Again, I just went to a shopping mall in this guy's uh, neighbourhood to take these uh, commercial photos. And again, just thinking about the location, thinking about the background, thinking about the story that I wanted to tell. I didn't want to tell a photo of being in shopping mall. I wanted to tell a sharp sort of feeling, business feeling. So I just went right looking for the right background. Again, just a flower in my garden. None of these is necessarily better than the other, but all I did was move. And when I moved my feet, I got these four different backgrounds depending on which way and direction I pointed in. This one here, again, this is little things. You've seen this one before. If I was to do this different, and this is a very old photo now, I would have, uh, I would probably clone this out or do something about this really bright spot because it's taking my eye. Same with this one, I'd probably get rid of this little area down here on the left, or I should have seen it when I took the photos. This one I did see, big blank of white, so I stepped to the left and then shot into this area behind him, and then you have a beautiful background. Horses, very busy, same as any event photography, motorbikes, uh, car racing, you have banners, you have tents, everything. But, you know, you can place yourself and give yourself the best chance to get the best background possible just by moving your feet and being aware of the images you're taking at the time and you can improve them without a question. This one, again, this is post-processing. I like the light at the end of the tunnel, but when I came to edit it, I decided that actually it was causing quite a distraction above the horse's head. So I got rid of that and put a little bit of light on the horse's face. And lastly, again, this is just a horse in one arena, and it's just a case of keeping an eye out and being aware of what which area is a good place to be photographing, when it passes, where, where the light is, that kind of thing. Lastly, to post-process or not, okay? I often hear, and I have said in the, myself in the past, 
I like my images to look like what they saw. <laughs> or I don't want to take things out of the image that you'd find there normally. Do I really need to do post-processing? And I've said all of these in the past. Uh, and normally it means that you're unsure of doing it or you can't be bothered to do it or you believe that something should stay as it was, which is absolutely fine. Um, but just be aware that sometimes those things in leaving them in can cause distractions in your images, okay? Post-production should only ever enhance your image. So again, ask yourself what you want your post-production to bring to the image. Post-production for a client can be very different to that for a competition, okay? But they're all always going to accentuate something or remove something, lift an overall feeling. Maybe they're gonna correct something that you didn't get quite right, such as a color bounce or exposure, or they might add an element of creativity. You might uh, find that you can balance the exposure or direct. One the big thing I like to do is direct the viewer to where I want them to look. Sometimes recropping can be a really good thing as well. And again, here's just a few examples where I've done some post-processing, okay? Just a very simple, I didn't like the back of here, and she, you can see she's in the shade, okay? So by cropping and then bringing the light to where I wanted to, just to lift it up very slightly. And I don't go mad with my post-processing, but you can see the massive difference it can make. This one's an awful one. I'm hoping that because it's small, you can't see how many dust spots there are, but I am actually amazed that I took the time to remove all these dust spots, to be honest. But this is the resulting image. It's a crop, it's a color change, all the dust spots removed and this edge here. Those people that do any animal photography, horse photography, you will know that quite often there's a lot to take out in these. And this is just a before and after shot to show you what can be done and depending on you know, how far you want to push it. Trees, not obvious what you would do, but you know, a little crop, a little bit of a play with some uh, sort of creative um, post-processing and then really bringing the attention to the bits that you want to bring attention to is really valuable. Cropping. I only own a 200 mil lens, so shooting birds is, <coughs> they end up being quite small. But if your sense is big enough, you can zoom in and you can make the thing that you wanted to be important in your image here. Again, this was actually way higher than me, so I couldn't get level with this, but this is the bit that I wanted to shoot. I didn't want this bit in the image, but I decided to shoot this bit here and then crop later. And I cropped along with the elements that I wanted to think about and changed it black and white as well because I really liked the textures. It wasn't really the colors that I was thinking about. And last but not least, just to show you the process, uh, what one might go through, or what uh, you, I might go through if I really wanted to get a shot. This is the first shots that I was taking, okay? It's not the same photo. I just wanna show you, this is where I started when I stood by the arena to start with. And then I figured out where I wanted to be. I wanted to be lower, I wanted to tilt the camera up, I wanted to zoom in. This is the end shot. And this is just a process through getting there. Okay, so here you had all the stuff, quite like the shot. So then I cropped in a little bit to maybe make him a little bit more important. Then I got rid of all the obvious bits, but I'd still got a little bit left. And then eventually I played with the clouds and I cropped got rid of any other distractions there at all. And then I went in black and white. So next time you are making a photo, remember every photo starts with the same basic decisions. What do you want your image to say? Okay, then go on and make the decisions about the lighting direction, the depth of field, the shutter speed, the composition, the balance, post-processing, all these things that you want to do afterwards. I hope I haven't bored you too much. I hope I haven't thrown too much information at you that you're thinking, oh my God. <laughs> and I hope you can make use of it. <laughs> are you still there, Rebecca, or have you gone to sleep? We are. Yes, I am here. <laughs> and everybody is still with you. Don't worry. I'll put my camera on so that you can still okay. see me. That was wonderful. That was not boring. It was absolutely <laughs> superb. There was so much content there. I think everybody's completely blown away. Um, but yes, really interesting. That's from Jane. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, so yes, wonderful images too. I was going through, as you were going through, I was oh wow, oh, that's really oh, wow. That's, and I bet everybody else was too. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> so we have got one question and that's from Mary and it's a very good one. How do we make it clear that it's intended to be low key or high key in an image? Ooh, <laughs> yeah, good question, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I don't actually shoot either of them. So <laughs> but I have been looking at people's work and I had to recently do something for uh, 52 frames. Uh, there was a low key challenge in that as well. And so it's it's just it's more about tones. It's although you want to make it low key or high key, you do still need to make sure. I think it's more making sure that it looks high key rather than blown out, basically, because there is a difference because it still requires a balance within the image of the tones. Even if you're going for high key or low key, you still need to have tonal differences within the images. Yeah. I'm not sure whether that's answered the question. I think that's that's a good answer. That's a good answer. Be be obvious in what you were doing, but technically correct at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. that's a great answer. I hope that's helped you, Mary. And that's all the questions. If you do have any questions, pop them in the um, Q&A for me now because we will be rounding up the session very soon. And Charlie, you've been an absolute trooper considering how no, how no, your throat gosh. <laughs> oh, and my cough medicine ready as well should i oh, <laughs> i can't be straight up <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you've got lots of thank yous and showers of praise Super. um so thank you it was wonderful and there was lots covered there guys so i'm i'm i, I assume you're all blown away with everything that um charlotte's just covered for us and it's one that yeah i know you'll be tuning in again too as soon as you can and um, so we've got a question from linda how can you have detail in light detail oh yeah good shadows, question yeah. how how can you have detail in lights can you see can you hear me charlotte sorry yeah i could see you i was yeah. just wanted to see whether i could see what the question was oh sorry uh, it's in it's in the chat section yeah in, so you might I have to scroll it come in very back. quickly and i just thought oh well, yes it was just um, kept bumping away then didn't it yeah referring to the no, highlights in the amsterdam shop so how can you um <clears throat> i think you're re- referring to the highlights in the show yeah yeah um how can you have detail in them sometimes what you need to do you have to make a decision at that point it's Generally, the, the ideal thing is to expose for the for the highlights if you're going to do that. The problem is in a night shot, you are, you know, the contrast is so different. What I quite often do in those situations is I will actually take two photos and I will bracket it within the two photos and I will actually pop the lights back in in, in Photoshop because then because sometimes it is nigh impossible, honestly, when you're shooting a, the sun coming up to try and get that sun right. And the rest of the image. Um, mm. A lot of people use graduated filters as well to try and get that. So that might be an option to use a graduated filter if the, the top of the image is brighter. Um, but yeah, I and I also use on the back of my camera. You have the the blinkies turned on, um, the highlights. I think. Um, so if I get too <laughs> many of those going blinkies. on, yeah, I will, <laughs> I will turn those on and I will just dial the exposure back just a little bit. But I won't ruin the rest of the image for it. Again, it depends whether you're shooting for competition or whether you're shooting for yeah. holiday photos or put it on the wall because there's a big difference um, between what yeah. you need to get absolutely perfect uh, for yeah. each of those different choices as well Hopefully yeah answers. I think that's a great <laughs> that's a great answer so Christy, Christine says if you want street light starbursts how do you get them without blowing the highlights uh, well, the starburst is related to the depth of field. It's, it's actually related to the, um, the f-stop or the depth of field you're using. So to get the starburst effect, you have to be at a high depth of field. So f22, something like that to start with. And that will give you the beautiful sort of starry effect that you get through. So already you're taking down the light that's coming through your camera by having a small hole mm. and a high f-stop already. Um yeah. Then again, it's just deciding how much of that starburst you want to be bright um, and how much you can dial it back. Yeah. And again, whether it's competition or not, really, as well. Because yeah. I mean, I love my Amsterdam image and I don't care. Beautiful. You, but uh, <laughs> if you put it in image of the month, and I probably did, it probably, you know, might have got a, a classified with, with all those yeah. burnt highlights because, you know, that's just the way it is. 
But then again, it comes back to that question. Is it for competition? Is it for you? Is it for the enjoyment of photography? Or is it for the client? Or is it competition? Absolutely. So you weigh things up, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've got another question. Do you use HDR? No. no. <laughs> I've tried it. I've tried it. I mean, by HDR, like I've tried merging images in Photoshop and Lightroom using the functions. And I don't like the effect personally that comes out because I find... Yeah. It doesn't look natural enough to me. What I will do is I will take two images into Photoshop and I will blend the bits that I want in there, which isn't quite HDR. That's more choosing mm. the bits I want to add in mm. <laughs> rather than letting the, letting the program do the whole thing to me. Because then yeah. you can actually control yeah. the points rather than just the whole thing. Yeah. But that is one way of trying to do it as well. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, lots of showering of praise coming through on the socials, uh, on the socials, on the chat. So, um, I'm so glad so many people managed to give up their lunch break for me. Yes, thank you so much for joining us, guys. Yeah, it's thank been, you very it's been much. a great time. Yeah, it has. Um, interestingly, what Roger has put, which I think is fantastically put, um, what an excellent presentation. So much that I may have heard before, which many of us may have, and we know them from a lot of you. Um, enter iom so you'll be familiar with a lot of the things um, that charlotte's talked about um, but he goes on to say but that was so well structured that i feel sure it will help me to question and assess every picture before depressing the button thank you so much so great i just wanted to make the i wanted to let you know that one because i thought it's very um, very on point these are the thing a lot of the things that we've covered are the fundamentals of photography that many of you will know um, and if you've been shooting a long time, you'll be thinking about them all the time. But it's just great to have them refreshed um, for when you go out again and to learn new things as well and have new things to think about. Yeah. So thank you so much. Brilliant. And for persevering with your poor throat yeah, and head. <laughs> we appreciate you so much. Thank you and taking the time out today. So go and rest. Hope you feel better ASAP. Yeah. Back to your sunshining self, which you already shined today. So, but thank you. Yes, we're getting. I hope you feel better soon on the on the chat as well. Um, so you take care. Thank you, everybody, for joining yeah. us. Thanks, everyone. We, yes, we'll we'll see you soon. See you next time. Bye.